I'm honored to introduce John Roberto to you. Um, he brings 30 years of experience in the software business, and um, he started out probably as a developer and then moved away from development through test engineering, uh, through project management, quality management, uh, so he knows the whole landscape. He also knows quite a few domains. He's been working in aerospace, uh, telecommunications, and consumer software, um, so he's seen it all. Right now, uh, he's a director of quality engineering at Concur. Um, maybe some of your companies are actually using this product. And um, today, he's going to be uh, explaining to us a little bit about how we can drive change from the quality team. You know, quality teams are not usually involved first in product development, so this is going to be very interesting. John, this all yours. Great. Thank you very much. And thank you, guys. I hope this is uh, um, engaging for you. Um, feel free to ask questions while I'm talking. I think it's better to cover that while we're talking about the topic. Uh, we are going to try to leave a few minutes at the end as well, uh, but don't be shy about asking questions. Um, the first thing I want to mention is I have a, a link, bit.ly uh, JR change, and it is um, case sensitive, so capital J, capital R, capital C change. Um, this link has links to all of the references that I'm going to be talking about today. So if you want to follow up, and I'll have this link at, on my last slide as well. Alrighty, but first let's start off with a story. Um, imagine a guy is out fishing in a beautiful Pacific Northwest. He's spay casting for steelhead in this picture. But uh, he's out there, it's a nice, beautiful, serene morning. He's hoping to catch that big fish. And what happens? A guy comes thrashing down a river. Psh, 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 help me, I'm drowning, I'm drowning. The guy drops his fly rod and dashes out, saves the guy, brings him up to the bank. He and his fishing buddies revive this, uh, this gentleman and everything is great. So they go back out fishing. A few minutes later, another person comes thrashing down the river. Psh, psh, psh. So they go off and they save the next person and they're celebrating, hey, we're heroes. And, you know, these stories, they always have three items, right? So, you know, the, the next step is a third person comes thrashing. Or well, our hero puts down his rod, and he doesn't go save the guy. He goes out, and he starts walking upstream. And his friends are like, what are you doing? He goes, you go save him. I'm going to go see who's throwing people in the river. <laughs> so... He is moving upstream, so we often like to talk about moving quality upstream, and this is what this gentleman is doing. And as quality leaders, that's what we need to do, is we need to move upstream to look at how we can prevent bugs. All righty, so um, this is interesting. Um, I had this slide in here, and I promise I had this in here from the very beginning, but it ties in very nicely to our keynote this morning when... Um, a gentleman talked about your identity. I had a, a person who was interviewing me, and they asked me, tell me about your title, because I was calling myself a quality leader. Um, and they said, how come you're not the test manager? I said, well, test manager, the focus for test manager is all around testing, whereas a quality leader, the focus is the full life cycle. It's to make sure that you know, we build a process that leads to high quality software. And the word manager is all about um, uh, managing the tasks around testing. So you're managing people, you're managing um, schedules, you're managing test suites, things like that. Versus a leader, it's more about influencing outcomes. So I've always called myself uh, the quality leader uh, for the teams that I've um, been because I, I want to have that brand of more holistic than just the test group, and also uh, helping to influence quality outcomes as opposed to just saying, hey, our product passes tests. Okay, um, getting into change. Change is very difficult, and most changes actually fail. There's a very, one of the uh, most famous authors around the idea of change, is, his name is John Cotter, and he writes for the Harvard Business Review. And he wrote a big paper about why do change efforts fail. And I have a link on that bit.ly link to the full article. 
Um, and he has eight steps. Eight, I'm not going to read them all to you. Um, but uh, he lists out eight reasons why they fail. And if you look at the list, the first four items, not establishing a great enough sense of urgency, not creating a powerful enough guiding coalition, lacking a vision, and under-communicating the vision by a factor of 10. Um, this, um, these first four reasons, half of his list, are all about what I call building a case for change. And we're, I'm going to spend most of the time talking about the first step in uh, change leadership, which is building the case and uh, kind of explaining why we need to change. Okay, the change curve. Um, you've probably seen, uh, have any of you seen this kind of change before? Yep, okay. So uh, the change curve uh, shows um, when you have your status quo um, and you want to make a change, what happens is your productivity drops and it actually falls negative for some period of time until the team starts seeing the, the victories and the, and, the, um, and the results of your change, then productivity grows. But so many uh, of the change efforts fail down in here because, you know, people start saying, well, that was stupid. This, you know, we're not getting anything done. And you get a lot of um, negative press for the change. So what we're going to talk about is um, some techniques to... A, explain why we're making the change and getting people to buy into it and even live through this negative dip and to accelerate the path through the negative dip. Uh, there's another change curve called the DREC curve, which stands for Denial, Resistance, Exploration, and Commitment, D-R-E-C. Um, and again, I have links to all, all of these models um, on that link. Um, and the DREC curve and the change curve are derived from something called the Kubler-Ross model. Um, who's familiar with the Kubler-Ross model? Okay, so you know this is the model um, for dealing with your emotions when a loved one dies. So leading a change in an organization is compared to the same grief level of when somebody passes away who's close to you. And so it's interesting how um, we've using the same uh, thinking uh, for corporate change as we do with dealing with grief. Alrighty, so I'm going to uh, go through and uh, talk about uh, the change model, but I'm going to illustrate steps of the change model with two changes that I've led. The first one is a process or an SLDC change. And this is where we were doing uh, releases every six weeks. We had four weeks of development, two weeks of uh, testing, and then we released to our customers. And we wanted to accelerate that to a monthly cycle. So, and we had about uh, three or 400 people on the team at the time. So it was a pretty significant uh, endeavor to uh, kind of change how we wanted to do that. Um, and I guarantee nobody thought uh, that um, we were uh, sandbagging with those six weeks. We were using every second of those six weeks. Uh, so uh, it was kind of a challenge to um, help the team through that change. Um, and the second is a technology change. So this is introducing static analysis into our development process. All righty. So before I get into the change model itself, I do want to talk about three roles in uh, change um, or change leadership. The first is the change leader. And this is... Uh, who we are in this room. We're the change leader, which is we're the ones who are going to drive the process to help the organization change. Um, so this, the rest of this presentation is geared towards the change leader. Uh, the change agent is a very important role, and there are met, hopefully many change agents. These are the people who are actively participating with your change. They're they agree with the change, and they're trying to help make it successful. Um, there is a video uh, that I have linked to uh, called The First Follower. It's the uh, leadership lessons from the dancing guy. Have any of you seen that? Okay, that, so that's a great video, isn't it? I, um, in the interest of time, I don't think I have time to show it, but if we do at the end, I will. Um, 
the key lesson in that video is it's okay, the, being a leader is one thing, but you're not really a leader until you have your first follower. Um, you, um, and the video shows a guy out there dancing kind of a wacky dance all by himself. But it wasn't until a second guy came on and started to dance alongside with him that that first guy became a leader. Then everybody else saw their friend emulating the original crazy guy, and then they emulated him. So all of the other followers in, the, um, in that session were actually following the first follower. They weren't following the, the main leader. So as you're leading the change, it's very important for you to identify who are your first followers, who are the change agents, who are the people that agree with you. And you want to publicly thank them. You want to help publicly support them and really encourage their participation. They're extremely important because everybody else in the organization, they're gonna see those folks following along. And when two or three people um, agree with a process change, then what you end up seeing is um, um, it's easier to get to a tipping point where everybody sees it. And then the third role is uh, what I call the passionate defenders of the status quo. And I think that pretty much goes self-explanatory. These are the people who don't want to change anything. And they're going to be the sticks in the mud. And these people are very important as well to pay attention to and build a relationship and really understand what their concerns are. And um, I'll show some techniques on how you can address their concerns and feed back to them. All righty. So here's the model. Um, Four steps, build the case for change, plan the change, test the change, and then roll out and make adjustments. Very simple model. Um, so building the case for change. Uh, first thing you need to do is just really identify a need. Uh, what do you need to change? So the, the previous, um, um, I caught just the tail end of the previous talk in this room and it sounded like a really compelling item. And if you wanted to try to drive that change, uh, one of the areas where you learn things are at conferences. You get best practices from other uh, companies and what other people have experienced. Hopefully you learn something um, in these two days that you're here at this conference and you something that you wanna try. And so hopefully the, these techniques for leading change will help you um, in implementing these changes. Okay, uh, retrospectives. Um, how many do retrospectives at the end of a release? Yep. Okay, most of us. And uh, how many of those respect, retrospectives feel repetitive? You keep bringing up the same issues over and over again. Yep, about the same list of people who raise their hand. Um, when you do that, don't, for the next time, just tackle one item. Just one of those items that repeat and just try to either minimize the impact or, um, you know, try to solve it. So um, definitely look at your retrospectives as opportunities to change. Um, benchmark other organizations, uh, defect escapes. Uh, I don't know how many times I've had the boss come in and go, how in the hell did this get out? And it's a big bug that our customers, they were nice to find it for us um, and report it. So that was nice of them. Um, but uh, that's an, always an opportunity for us to think about, okay, something went wrong, maybe this, we should change the way we're doing things. Um, root cause analyses and risk analysis. So root cause analyses, again, something goes wrong, you understand the root cause, you go try to tackle that. Um, and risk analysis is where you look at your system before something goes wrong, look at what potentially could go wrong, the likelihood of it happening, and uh, also any mitigations you might have in place. So the risk mitigation may lead to a change opportunity. So build the case for change. Um, I had a boss who uh, used to say, what's your burning platform for this change? And uh, he kept using the phrase burning platform. I'm like, what does that mean? Well, what it means is imagine you're on this oil platform and you're standing on that deck and it catches fire. You have a very clear, compelling reason to change your status quo. 
you're either going to be in the water or you're going to be burnt up. Uh, so um, building a burning platform for change means telling a story so compelling that people can't imagine staying, staying pat, staying with the status quo. So think about whenever you're leading the change to tell those stories. What can possibly, um, well, you want to tell the story, how can, um, um, in a way that the people can't imagine, stick in the same way. Okay, uh, example. Uh, this is for the static analysis. Um, again, if I, re I mentioned we did a six-week development cycle, four weeks of development, two weeks of testing. And during those two weeks, we used to find a lot of bugs. And it was the reason why it took two weeks is because we found a lot of bugs. So we started tracking the root cause of those bugs. We found out after a couple of releases, we had plenty of data, that 70% of the issues were very simple coding errors. So then I met with the development team and said, okay, here's the data. We kind of reviewed it and, and then we did some brainstorming sessions and we said, okay, what can we do differently? And um, you know, developers uh, ended up saying we need to improve um, our unit testing, need to improve our code review. I said, okay, well, we're already doing those. And then the third item was uh, static analysis. Ah, that's not something we're currently doing, so let's look at adding static analysis as part of our um, uh, life cycle and toolkit. So um, collecting the root cause data helped us identify an area to go change. Okay, now as you're thinking about building your case for your change, you have different audience members that you're talking to. So you need to speak the, their language. So um, when you're thinking about uh, developers, um, I find that most developers are pride themselves in productivity. And so usually uh, looking at improving their productivity is an item uh, that is of interest to developers. Um, Next is uh, testers. Again, I think testers and quality engineers, same as developers, um, probably value their productivity. They want to get important things done, want to get a lot of things done with minimal waste. Uh, product managers, they tend to think about, um, and this is my experience, um, uh, feature velocity. How many features can we get out there? We have all this backlog of stuff that we want to deliver to our customers. How can we get faster? Um, at um, releasing these features. So um, when you think about um, engaging with the product owners um, and you have maybe it's a technical change, like in that static analysis example, I, when I talked to the product owners, I talked about efficiency in uh, getting uh, our code out solid, uh, bug-free, quicker so we can get it quicker to our customers. Um, project managers, uh, they tend to uh, value predictability. Um, so again, uh, removing risk out of the program, um, having more predictable schedules, uh, those are things that are valued. Um, having more linear burndowns seem to be valuable to scrum masters. Um, I'm putting some generalizations out there, but what's important is for when you think about your audience, that you speak the language that appeals to them. And it was kind of interesting, the, um, the update um, example from our keynote this morning where um, he talked about addressing multiple audiences with these different thinking modes. So I want to think about how to incorporate that into this uh, thinking as well. Oh, and, and the leadership team. They're usually thinking about the bottom line, you know. Uh, so, how can we um, improve the business efficiency? How can we grow the top line um, with better sales or less cost? Alrighty. So, communicate in the language of your developers. So, here's a kind of a marketing um, technique: is you want to talk about your ideas. Um, and the vision behind the ideas. So you have an idea. I had an idea which was to introduce static analysis, um, but there was also a vision behind that. So I want to communicate in the vision, not just 
tell my idea. Um, again, features and benefits is another way of looking at this. Uh, we often look in terms of, hey, this is a feature that our product can do, but you really want to be able to talk in to the benefits uh, that um, this feature is going to convey to the end user. So these are analogous to how you want to speak when you're starting to lead this change and build your case for change. And I have some examples here. So um, I first uh, developed this talk while I was in uh, San Francisco and uh, Silicon Valley. There's a new law that's passed where it's mandatory to have this photograph in every presentation. <laughs> so I comply with that law. Um, but um, when Apple Computer um, first had the idea to build the iPod, um, it came from, I think, um, um, in the Seattle area, the real player. Um, one of the executives from the real player company, and I forgot his name, joined Apple and convinced Steve Jobs to go into this market. Um, but what Steve did, and the idea was to, hey, let's couple a hard drive with an MP3 player so you can um, have a lot of music. And Steve was like, no, that's not how we're going to sell this. And he sold it by saying, I want to have a thousand songs in my pocket. And so that was his vision. The MP3 player and a hard drive, that was the idea. So having a thousand songs in your pocket is the vision or that's the benefit you're going to convey. MP3, hard drive, those are the specific technologies which are going to get you there. Now why this is important, um, it might be these technologies aren't the ones that are going to get you to your vision. It might be MP3 is the wrong format, consumes too much power, I don't know. Um, so let's go look at a different technology. But we're still going to stick with the vision. We want to deliver something that delivers a thousand songs that our customers can have in their pocket. Okay, so faster release cycles. That's the feature. We're going to move faster. We're going to go from six weeks down to monthly. Um, that's the feature. The benefit is quicker feedback from our customers. So we have an idea. Um, it's part of a um, story that we select for a release. Um, if we have a monthly cycle, we're going to get feedback from our customers two weeks earlier than we would have had otherwise. And so then we can iterate on that idea uh, faster and more and, and refine it to get to the right idea uh, exactly for our customers. So uh, when I started talking about we're going to move faster, it was all about, hey, we need to get faster feedback from our customers. Uh, static analysis is part of the build. I mean, that sounds boring when I just said it. Um, but the um, idea, that's the feature, that we're going to do static analysis. Um, but what I told the developers, I said, hey, how would you like an automated code review buddy? Um, a automated checker that's going to check your code for you, give you private information, give you private feedback uh, just for you so you can help improve your code. And they, they like that idea better than uh, a big brother static analysis tool uh, checking up on them. How are we doing on time? Okay, well, okay cool. Thank you. Um, all right, so now we've built our case for change. Now it's time to plan the change. So um, I've mentioned before, communication is very key. So you want to do a lot of communication, both two-way communication when you're doing uh, building your plan. So um, first step is see if you can get your change, um, your vision, and your benefits um, included as part of your organization's goals. So in the case of the uh, static analysis, our VP had a goal uh, for reducing technical debt. So I was able to tie um, the static analysis investment directly to that technical debt uh, goal. For the faster release cycles, I was able to uh, actually had that listed as a goal for the whole organization. So the VP um, broadcast that as part of our annual goal for that year. And what that does is that helps inform everybody else that this is important. Um, so getting it added to, um, you know, maybe one click up on the goals is 
um, an important technique. Next is uh, team meetings. So uh, for the faster release cycles, if I mentioned we had about 300 people working on the team at that time. Um, we had a lot of different teams. So I asked all of the managers if I could have 20 minutes in each of their staff meetings. So I met with every team individually and presented the idea of kind of how we were thinking about doing it. Um, we met uh, several times throughout the year as I would give them updates on where we are with the process and, and get their feedback. So it was a great way to, in a, an efficient way to talk to many people. Um, the other uh, bit was the all hands. Um, so, you know, the VP had this as a goal on his goals. So um, he gave me five minutes um, at each of his all hands to give an update to everybody. And again, that, that, what that did um, was it gave everybody an update where we are, but it also, um, the VP was signaling that this is a, an important change. So um, it was an important thing to do to uh, do that in a public way. And so that was his way of supporting, uh, supporting me in this change. And then one-on-one -on -one sessions. And these are extremely important. So I probably had 40 to 50 one-on-ones with key people uh, for that uh, change, uh, for the accelerating the life cycle. Um, and it's very important to talk to them on one-on-one -on -one because uh, what you get is what they're really feeling and not posturing in front of the rest of the group. And uh, you can really dig in and invest a lot of time in really understanding what their concerns are. And same way with the benefits, you know, the people who are really uh, supportive, you can really understand, hey, what do you like about this and uh, what can we build on? So um, having that one-on-one -on -one time, especially with the uh, naysayers, is very important. All righty. Um, so again, identify the pe these one-on-ones and team meetings. You're gonna, some people are going to be ver um, verbal, and they're the ones who are going to tell you who they are by asking questions or making comments about what you're changing. So um, through these communications, you can actually follow up with the folks and really understand what, what's going through their mind. Okay, and then for the people that are the passionate defenders of the status quo, um, you know, I found that often they, they do a lot of pushback and there's a, something behind their pushback usually. And um, I learned to ask open-ended questions. I would say, what needs to change to make this vision a reality? So again, I come back to the vision, not the specific idea, because you know, they may have qualms about a specific technology. But I want to get them uh, telling me, how can we make this um, a reality? What needs to change? Same way with uh, what is working that we need to preserve. Often people are worried about uh, losing out on something that's already there that uh, we need to preserve. And then what worries you? What are the risks that we should be uh, uh, focused on for this um, change? Now you have all this data. Grab a little water. Okay, uh, the goals grid is a great way to organize this information and feed it back to your uh, audience. Um, again, the goals grid, there's a nice paper, a template on the link um, for that um, bit.ly link that I provided. But uh, the goals grid is a two by two matrix and you can't be a manager without presenting a two by two matrix at some point. Everybody does these, so here's mine for today. Uh, the goals grid organizes along two dimensions. The first dimension, or the y-axis, is is this desirable or undesirable? And on the x-axis, things that we don't have today and things that we already have today. So those items that are desirable and we don't have, we need to achieve. We need to preserve those items that are good that we still have. And we need to avoid the bad things that we don't have and eliminate the last category, those items that are bad that are there. Ten minutes. Thank you. So um, here is the um, grid that I filled out for the six-week change, uh, six weeks to four. 
So um, one of the items that we all agreed on is we had to have a firm completion milestone. So as I mentioned, we had two weeks of test. Uh, we did a um, thought exercise. We said, okay, what if by some magic wand we had a bug-free build? And at the beginning of that two-week cycle, how long would it take us to run all the tests that we need to do to feel confident that we can release? And the answer was about two days. The rest of that time was spent dealing with the late changes and defects and everything else. So we kind of had a feeling for uh, what we needed to do, which was really have a firm completion milestone where we got a lot of the defects out of the way and that we didn't take late changes. And it turned out we were taking a lot of late changes because the duration between releases was so long, the business people would say, we can't possibly wait six more weeks. So by having a four-week cycle, we were able to uh, uh, convince them that it was a good trade-off. Um, so that brings me to an, one of the things we had to eliminate, which is this feature must release on this date uh, mindset. Again, a lot of the business folks had um, their goals and their quarterly objectives uh, to get their release out. And so that was the, the driving force behind that was their commitment really to the boss and what showed up in, on some PowerPoint somewhere. So when we probed really deeply, it didn't really go beyond that. We didn't have overwhelming customer demand for these things, so it was kind of an internal thing. So we were able to then work on, with the business leadership, um, again, if we stop taking these late um, changes, we can actually move faster and get you what you want, which is a faster, um, uh, release to our customers. Uh, the support team, they were very ner nervous about going faster because uh, we did these uh, four hour long demos that informed the support team what was in the new release and they didn't want to lose that. And lastly, a lot of people were worried that we were going to just do the same thing, just you know, be onerous and press people to work harder and faster and do more overtime. So we called that out specifically that we're not going to do that. Um, what we're going to do is actually change our uh, practices. So the goals grid is a great way to organize the thoughts and feed them back to the um, um, audience. Now, did I mention communication? Okay. I want you to think about McDonald's. Okay. You see McDonald's, you know where the closest McDonald's is to your home or to your office. You know what's on their menu, you know what it costs, you know what it tastes like, and you know how you're going to feel after you eat it. So <laughs> you have an extremely high awareness of McDonald's, um, yet they still spend a billion dollars a year on advertising. And that communication has to happen often for you to build that high awareness. So I often feel... Um, I don't want to spam the mailing list again with another update. I, I sent an email out last week. Everybody knows this already. No, send it out again. Build a Slack channel. Post it to Slack. Get into the all hands meetings. You want to communicate often because people need to hear the message multiple times before it really digs in. And uh, everybody's busy. You know, nobody's really remembers an email you sent out a week ago. Okay, now it's time to test a change. So that we have uh, five minutes until the five minute Q&A. Okay, so we have 10 minutes total. All right, cool, thank you. Uh, so uh, scientific method, you want to, um, your, um, your idea at this point is merely a hypothesis. You believe this is gonna solve the problem or you believe this is gonna implement your vision. Now you have to test that. So I want to give a couple of examples. Um, for the faster releases, our hypothesis was if we had that firm completion milestone, we could actually finish all of the testing in one week. So the way we tested that is we had a couple of releases where we still had uh, six weeks in the plan, but we told everybody, here's the new uh, release criteria, here's the new definition of that milestone, and um, we tried to stick to the new milestone. It ended up, it took us eight days instead of the full two weeks that first time. So we improved, um, but we still weren't quite there with the one week. 
and that was eight uh, working days. Uh, we didn't want to um, work over the weekends and push people uh, just to make this artificial deadline. But um, what we ended up having to do is actually up our change control uh, by putting locks on change control where you couldn't actually check in late um, unless you had permission from the release manager. So um, our testable prediction, we designed an experiment that, um, and then we ran the experiment, we learned something, and we refined the plan. Same way with uh, static analysis. Um, big worry with static analysis is many of these tools produce a lot of false positives, and also you end up getting a ton of uh, legacy data. So you've been developing a lot of code, and uh, the tools pop out a lot of legacy um, defects that have been there forever. Um, and you go, well, what do I do with 3,000 errors that just popped in overnight? So our hypothesis was that there was a tool that uh, would be effective for us. So um, our experiment is we set a summer intern free on, hey, go try out uh, these dozen tools. And uh, he actually found uh, two tools that worked very uh, well together. So we ended up implementing two tools um, instead of just one. All righty. So um, might be a little hard to tell, but in 1967, on December 3rd, Sweden, the country of Sweden, decided to switch from driving on the left to driving on the right. And this is that day. <laughs> so um, they had an extreme, and this is called Dagen H, which stands for H day. And this is the H word, which uh, I'm not even going to try. But that, that literally means to switch to the right. Um, so um, what Sweden did was they had many years of advertising and, and informing people. They had some nice logos and uh, getting the whole country prepared for this day. They did the day, and it was utter chaos. But that didn't last very long. It just lasted a few days until people got used to it. And then uh, once everybody was driving on the right-hand side of the road, um, everything went smoothly. So the message here is when you implement your change, it's going to get messy, and you're going to have issues, and you're going to have some of the naysayers come in and say, I told you so. Um, you have to really push through that. Remember the example for these guys, um, and really just work through the glitches. So it's important to actively seek out risks and issues. So don't just assume everything is going to be great, or if you're not looking for risks, they're not happening. They are. You need to actively seek them out. Um, communicate openly about risks and progress to the team. It's very important to be transparent at this point. And then ask for feedback. So again, always use open-ended questions like, how can we improve this plan? Somebody says this was a stupid idea. You said, how can we improve is your uh, follow-up question. And then uh, next is uh, show progress. This is my favorite graph of all time that I've ever made. And I'll tell you why. This is the number of defects that we found by static analysis. We were finding about 250 the first month when we first started using it. Again, this is uh, daily builds. We're running the full scan, and um, the tool is popping out about 250 defects a month. We have the same development team developing the same amount of code, same velocity. Uh, six months later, it's less than 100. What was happening was the way we designed the static analysis tool was it was given private feedback directly to the developer. So if the tool pop found an error, it did a lookup and change control. Who checked that in? OK, I'm going to send a message with the error. Developers were learning uh, what types of um, issues were going to be found, mostly um, not protecting um, um, object dereferences from a null. So they were doing a lot of null pointer exceptions um, were the types of errors. So the developers were literally um, writing better code as a result. But it was, it's important to show in some way that uh, your changes are effective. All righty. I think uh, we're right up at time. So the summary is um, building a burning platform is the most important step. Um, speak in the language of your audience. Articulate your vision, and uh, be in love with the vision, um, not your particular solution. You want to remember, you're, you should be refining and testing and evaluating your solution 
uh, but you always want to have eyes pointed to that vision. Communication, if I mention that, that's, yeah, I think I mentioned that. Um, and persist when it gets difficult. Um, and, oh, and also ask yourself, after a while, are you truly solving the original problem? So um, that's always an important thing to keep in mind. Sometimes, you know, introducing a new technology may have a life of its own, but you want to ask yourself, are we really uh, solving the problem that we set out to solve, or are we in love with this solution? All right, cool. So we have some time for Q&A. Again, here's some of my contact information. I'm happy to uh, follow up afterwards. Um, here's the bit.ly JR change has the links to all of these sites. And um, also, just a quick word for my sponsor, I work for Concur, Travel and Expense Management. How many people use Concur? Oh, wow, awesome. Um, catch me and tell me what you don't like about it so I can get some good feedback back. But uh, we have a booth here if you want to learn more about our company. Okay, please, questions? Yes, yes, sir. Yeah, uh, good question. So um, the, to repeat the question, um, I was polite by saying people who are the status, uh, the, the passionate defenders of the status quo, some people may undermine your, um, your change and um, do um, um, negative behaviors in the place. You gotta talk to that person directly. That's why I emphasize the one-on-one -on -one meetings and um, the, if you find somebody who's un, trying to undermine, you just, you have to ratchet it up. Um, communicate with that person directly and say, hey, what's, you know, we have to really work as a team. We have to get everything above board so we can solve all the issues. And you want to, you do want to actively listen to what their true concerns are if you can try to, to get through that. I know sometimes people are actively disengaged and probably won't be honest or, Maybe they just feel, um, you know, they're not happy in their role, but then you need to escalate it also and have a meeting with them and, and their uh, leader to really flesh it out and at least ask them um, if, you know, well, and I would also say actively consider is there feedback, is there any merit to it, and see if there is anything you can tweak in the plan. But sometimes you'll just have to tell them, um, you know, cut it out because the rest of the team is all on board with this and you're the outlier. I know, I'm the, the last one before lunch. Yes? Okay. Yeah. Okay, good. Yeah, thank you. Uh, so uh, the question is, um, building a burning platform, um, it could be the chicken little or the boy who cries wolf, basically, um, and what are some of the mitigations there? Um, definitely you have to pick your battle. Um, and also, um, you want to be able to show back up your um, your point of view with data. So, you know, as, as we went through the areas of where you find opportunities for change, you know, I had a lot of data for me on the static analysis, and I reviewed that data with the developers, and we came to that conclusion together. Um, the um, Accelerating the, the life cycle. Had a lot of industry comparisons that a lot of other companies our size with this product actually release every two weeks. And so we had a lot of supporting data um, to, to back up the idea. And also a, a big part of um, building a burning platform is 
Um, and again, burning platforms, the metaphor to make it a very clear choice between sticking with what we're doing and, and changing. Um, it's not literally you want the, everything's on fire all the time. Um, yeah, you don't want to drive a false sense of urgency. Um, oh, this one customer complained, so therefore we're going to be out of business next week. You want to moderate that and, and really uh, use that, the data that you have um, and listen to the stakeholders. Listen to the, the business leaders, the developers, uh, your leadership um, when you share that data. That, that's, I would say, protect yourself uh, from uh, Chicken Little syndrome by actually being able to show data. Cool. Alrighty. Hey, hey, I want to thank you guys very much. This was a great audience. Thank you.